Welcome to Journey on the Fly, the podcast, where we talk about fly fishing and life. Let's get at it, right? So tonight we are joined by guest Joe Goodspeed. Joe is going to give us a lay of the land as far as product development and things of that sort go when it comes to great fly fishing products. So stick with us. I hope you enjoy this. And remember to download these episodes, leave us some comments. And if you like what we're doing, go ahead and give us the appropriate star rating. And you could find us on any of the places that podcasts are played from iHeartRadio, Spotify, iTunes, you name it. If we're not there, let me know and we'll make sure we get there. So let's get at it. Journey on the fly. If the zombie apocalypse was coming, who are three people that you would want on your team? Whatever team means. I would, I would choose people that are, I would choose friends of mine that I'm familiar with who they are and what their skills and reasoning is behind things more so than choosing, I don't know, some, you know, really, really smart or certain talented person that I don't know. So that's my answer to that. All right. I love that. It's kind of like, um, there, there was a, a trick question. I think it was asked publicly years ago. Um, and I don't, if you're, I don't know if you're familiar with, a um, an author he's passed now, his name is GK Chesterton. And he was he was from the UK and a really incredibly brilliant man. But he was in a room of of kind of authors and professors and stuff. And they posed this question trying to, to stumble somebody. Um, and this isn't where this conversation is going, but it just it's kind of relevant to how you answered it. Um, so they asked them and there was pastors and there was professors and all just different walks of life. If you were stuck on a remote island, uh, what would be the one book that you'd want to take with you? And of course, you know, you got the pastor saying the Bible, you got the professor saying, you know, poetry or something like that. And Chesterton says, I'd like a book on how to build a raft because I don't want to be stuck on a remote island. And the questions, the answer to that question is, I think, similar to yours, that you want the people that you can trust and you know, rather than the guy that can, you know, skilled in this area and you have no idea of even his ethics and he might end up eating you in a couple of days or something. Right. Nevertheless, um, Joe, give us, uh, take your time, whatever, a couple minutes, 10 minutes, however, whatever you feel, and tell us a, a little bit about yourself. And I know that's an awkward question um, because not all of us, you know, are about talking about ourselves, but have a little freedom if you like and um, be generous and tell us a bit about yourself. Well, <clears throat> I'm often asked if my educational background is in engineering, uh, which it's not. So I, uh, my, my background is I went to, I looked at uh, colleges based entirely on athletics because I was very focused on high jumping when I was in, uh, in high school there and i was in new york state i was the second uh, ranked high jumper uh, in the state when i was coming out of high school and uh and so i was looking at schools based on that and also looking at majors based on what would be easiest for me to do while i was high jumping and so i uh when it was kind of like when forrest gump went through alabama and, and for after four years of playing football he got a degree I got a, uh, after four years of high jumping and other, and other jumping, I, uh, was doing English literature as a major, which was mostly writing, which I was pretty good as a writer, but I could have been going to college for engineering type, uh, stuff. But, uh, yeah, I got an English literature degree from SUNY Geneseo in Western New York. And then, uh, right after that, I got into working in the uh, in the fly fishing industry first for Cortland Line, where I did uh, a bunch of things with products and development, uh, and I oversaw the line production room there. And then 
uh, after I, I left Cortland Line was kind of going through some changes with the uh, with the management when I left there in 2015, and I did I worked at uh, Thomas and Thomas for nearly six years. I designed like uh, 60 rods there, about 55 rods there while I was working there. And now after leaving uh, TNT last uh, March, I've been doing Diamondback uh, brand rods where I am once again designing a whole bunch of stuff. So how did you end up at Cortland? Was it just you get out of school and you saw a job opening and you fly fish and you're like, I'm going to go for this? Or was there kind of a different thought to you when you were going after that? I put my best foot forward and reached out to Cortland and said that I wanted to work in the fly fishing industry. And they gave me a job in customer service. And after about a month, they fired me because I was useless in doing a job like that. But, uh, and while I was there, I was, I was very obviously wanting to dabble in stuff more with the products. And I was also long I won't go into the reasoning why, but I, it, t- it turned out the reason they let me go was was not legitimate, and it came to light after I'd left there, and then later down the road, a couple years later, after I was doing, I was coaching track at Ithaca College, they reached out to me out of nowhere and were asked me to do uh, product work. They were relaunching the Climax brand. But uh, they hired, I came back into Cortland after a couple of years out of college. And, uh, and then right away, I started doing product work. So initially, I was fired from that, uh, that uh, company in pretty short order in my first job out of college. You know, it's, that's interesting because I had just had a conversation with somebody today about how I think one of the... Um, the, the, the key like the, the clarifying points of a of a good employer and, and I don't know how this unfolded and why they reached out to you, but it it could be something like that is that the good employer sees the 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 things that the employee is really good at and passionate. Maybe it's not what they hired you for, but they figure it out and they put them in that position and they thrive. And although that may not be exactly how it all unfolded, it sounds like that's the direction that things kind of began to 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 turn for you because there's things that I can't stand doing. I do only out of necessity, and I know I'm not doing as 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 nearly good as 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 the next person who might you know be passionate about counting how many flies are in a box or something like that. But um, it's pretty neat that you took the initiative and and dove into it anyways. <clears throat> so. How long have you personally been fly fishing, and how did you find your way into it? Was it was it a family uh, member that introduced you to it? I, I came from an outdoor family that was not into fly fishing, and around maybe 10 years old, my grandfather was doing some fly fishing stuff and uh, and got me the stuff to do some fly tying, which... I probably did fly tying stuff for a few years <clears throat> before I switched from fish regular gear type fishing to fly fishing. That was around like I might have been 13, 12 or 13, but I I taught myself to cast from just getting gear that was passed around and became very good at uh at casting at a at a young age you know be, before i was by the time i was th- probably 14 ish i could cast as well as i can cast now and i've won the industry casting you know competition against people like steve ray jeff a couple times you know i my cat i don't want to pound my chest too much about my casting background but i can distance cast very well and could since i was like 14 years old and that has helped me move into some of the product development positions and the fly line, you know, design type things. My ability to cast and understand the products that I'm holding in my hand have a lot to do with how, you know, what my skill set is when it comes to designing something new. 
that's just to me that's another layer of um i i say sometimes like and i think uh, any fly fisherman would agree with this fly, fly fisher would agree with that the statement that fly fishing just has so much to teach us about life in general and even some uh, uh details and, and patient development and things like that but that to me is almost direct application of you know fly fishing gave you the skills in a sense as you developed your skills to actually apply them in the in the industry in a way that just well I, I get bullied for this one but maybe just hiring an engineer that has never picked a rod up but that but knows how to you know calculate numbers and algorithms or things of that sort and it's so much different when you have the the the, the touch and the feel already built into you from some experience to to apply it so that's really cool and i would imagine that the um the distance casting comes in Quite often, being that the uh, uh, the word on the proverbial street, aka the internet, um, in in my own personal digging uh, in, into you is that you have a bit of liking to chase after toothy critters. I have I've got a handful of things that I that I really like to do, and that uh, that for sure is one of them. Yeah, that definitely gives you the um, the amount of casts to continue to hone it and to continue to keep keep it in there. That's for certain because. Of a, a friend of mine who picked up a fly rod for muskie about seven years ago, I think he told me, and he hasn't picked up a rod for any other species outside of taking his two daughters out since then. And he's constantly trying to get me out on the boat with him and uh, to go into some of the spots to go after him, but I just haven't been able to to bend time to get to him yet. So, so your first fish was it stalked, wild, brookie? Uh I don't, <clears throat> I don't know. Yeah, I, I can't say for certain. Okay. I I was catching fish, not fly fishing, since I was tiny. So it's hard to. I I would imagine it might have been like a sunfish or a bullhead. Okay. But <laughs> but uh, I I don't have like a dis distinct like pic picture of or memory of, of or my first fly caught fish. It's fantastic though to hear that you came from an outdoor family. I think that is, as a dad, that is just incredibly important. I see a lot of dads that um, use fishing sometimes, or even uh, men in general, to, to get away from uh, family. And it's wonderful to see families come together in, in, in the outdoors because it's just, it's kind of like um, those, those just certain distinct memories of whether it's harvesting your first deer or something with your grandfather or your dad it's just really seems to be a way to to connect with people deeper than um maybe the average person who doesn't have that kind of background so that's that's really cool do and, go ahead go ahead and for me that was my father exposed me to all of these opportunities i had to you know my fishing background as far as the trout goes, was my father would take me on a month long camping trip, letting me basically go and fish wherever I wanted in the Western States every year for about 10 years from when I was 11 to 21, say. And so whether it was Montana, Colorado, Idaho, Utah, Wyoming, all of those states were places that I got to spend time in some of the best spots. And, you know, for before muskies, you know, I was giving talks about my trout fishing techniques when I was in my early 20s for trout unlimited groups across uh, central New York and places that uh, that I lived before I ever caught any, you know, predator fish on the fly. And that background came from being able to fish in all of these different places and situations and tie flies based on what I was seeing as i was uh, in much younger so that uh contributed a lot not maybe not to uh so much the predator fishing but my strategies and my ability to adapt to different changing conditions and totally different environments and and my father relayed from a very young age my dad is a very good engineer and 
my that side of my the way I think comes from my father and right from the youngest age he made it clear to me that you could do you could fish more effectively than the people around you by making a precise adjustment hmm. and that was always something that was that's just how I approached everything when it came to fishing when I was very small and and still now but I think that, that definitely came from you know early lessons from my father that's that's fantastic i appreciate you sharing that and any dads out there that are listening to this take note to how important it is with the 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 time and the development of uh, relationship with your kiddos and getting them outside and investing because it's exactly what it is it's an investment i think so you are now with um diamondback Give us a yeah. little bit of kind of the history because Diamondback kind of faded out and now it seems like there's a revival, a renaissance of, of, of the company. Is, am, am I right by saying that? Yeah, it's a, it's a pretty old company. And <clears throat> for a long time up near Stowe, Vermont, there was a manufacturing facility that uh, was building those blanks. And that closed down in 2012, I believe. And uh, Cortland Line was owning the brand then and the and the brand has changed ownership one more time from uh from Portland line to the current uh, ownership who uh who is basically funding what i'm doing to let the brand be stuff that i'm generating for the the products and i've had a lot of ideas for specialty products and the and so Diamondback is in the process of reflecting that with some of the it won't just be nymph rods, it's nymph rods first because that's such a vibrant market in the fly community. But uh I have certain predator rod models that are on on deck that I'm putting a lot of effort into the development of the blanks being exactly what I want them to be. So it's the Diamondback right now is stuff that I'm designing, but uh, Diamondback doesn't have that manufacturing facility here anymore. This, the uh, the stuff that I'm doing now is is being built uh, overseas, but but built to my specifications and really precise manufacturing settings that give me capabilities that I haven't had anywhere else in my uh, in my career. And I, I did some rod design at Coralin too. This is Diamondback's really the third company that i've done uh, rod development for so it's it's a silly question to ask why rod development i guess because it's it's all part of the mechanics and passion of, of fly fishing it seems from your from your early days all the way through to where you're at today but given that um can you give us some details what does it look like to to design a rod um from ground up or whatever i mean obviously toss the ball so we can all catch it because we aren't all as smart as you but <laughs> um I, because i think it's interesting i'm the kind of person that i work on my own cars as much as i can until it gets incredibly ridiculous but i want to know how things work because it gives me better ideas just as a car as an example that if i hear this sound or the car's doing this i i know what's going on my thoughts on you explaining this is that it might give us a little bit idea on honing things and choosing rods and whatever, um, however that may work per uh, fly fisher. Okay. <clears throat> well, are you familiar with what a Rubik's Cube is? Yep. So in a Rubik's Cube, you have a bunch, you've got, I think, six sides that have if the cube is in its square initial orientation, they all have the same, you know, a solid color on each side. And as you manipulate the Rubik's cube, or if it's unsolved and you're and you're manipulating it, there are like there's six variables that you are manipulating as far as those those surfaces of the faces of the cube are are being changed and that's and what i'm going to say has nothing to do with that but the 
having something where there's just a handful of very dynamic variables that you are manipulating is what rod design is like. And there's really four basic ones. It's a question I've answered a lot of times. And the if the I could easily describe these things in a way that would be talking over people's head, I think, with some of the technical knowledge I have of every aspect of this. But if you look at a road cone, like an orange road cone, okay, the from the top to bottom, there's a certain expansion rate of the taper of that cone. And so if the expansion if the expansion rate of that cone, if that was a metal mandrel that you were building a part of a rod out of, if the expansion rate was more narrow, the cone would be thinner. And if the expansion rate was more dramatic, the cone would be fatter at the bottom. Okay. So that's one of the most major variables that can be manipulated in rod design is how steep the expansion of the taper of the mandrel or the, you know, a four piece rod may have will most likely have four different taper rate mandrels that make up the four sections and an example of a taper rate of a mandrel that would be used in a fishing rod would be 0 0.003 inches change per linear inch of the mandrel so 0 0.003 change over uh 100 inches would give you an expansion where of like a taper of a rod that would so that's just that and i'm not gonna throw around too many of those numbers but uh, yeah that's that's an example of an expansion rate of a of a mandrel that would make up a part of a four-piece fishing rod for some of the stuff that we use in the industry today so you have the expansion rate of the mandrel, and then you have the composition of the material. And then you have the wall thickness of how much of that material you wrap around that mandrel. And when I say material, really, there's it's a two part thing where there's unidirectional fibers and then there's reinforcement fibers. And there's a lot of different ways that you can reinforce some unidirectional fibers and different fabric area weights where the unidirectional fibers are spread into a thicker cloth or a thinner cloth, which allows for more or less revolution of the overall layup of material around the mandrel. Those are some of the uh, variables within material, but so th those are really that's within the core of of how rods are designed is the expansion rate of the mandrel and the composition of the material and then the way that material or materials that work together are wrapped around the uh the mandrel to form a tube structure that is is going to have the properties of a rod section that's really cool um so and then when you you're going through these um, um, these prototypes, we'll call. I'm assuming that you're building these at at uh, with different materials, different wraps, um, different rates, and so forth. Are there like proprietary type machines in the world of fly fishing that are testing some of this, or is the best way to test it is to build this thing and get it out there and and toss some flies around with it? Uh, that's to me this is the really cool aspect of the difference in design in the in the fly industry is the majority of the industry wants to do it mathematically and so they'll use deflection boards where they will look at what the shape of the bend of the rod is and they can compare the shape of the bend of a rod to other companies' products that are, you know, in similar line weights. They can put the same amount of weight off the rod tip at the same angle and look at how the bend of those rods is different. 
And if there's maybe like a flat area in the bend, if they are designing the rod, but without letting a rod recover from a bend, there is only so much you can tell. And people know, you know, when they're designing rods out of a similar graphite or everybody's using high modulus graphite, what they're comparing, but it, you're, it's like looking out of one eye looking at the bend of a rod but not knowing what it feels like when it unbends which is where the performance of the rod all comes from is what the recovery performance of the rod looks like that and and strength and durability are, are what it's all about those factors are things that are subjective more than objective gotcha. you know the making using the using the bend on the wall is a way of kind of putting things into a mathematical vein where you can uh, use a number of different uh, tools to adjust your bend knowing that that's what you're trying to do but there's very few people in the industry and th and the reason there's very few people in the industry who are going to do what i'm going to describe is uh you almost always have the people who are an expert caster or angler are not the same people who understand what the final steps of changing the pattern of material that's going or choosing the different taper expansion rate when it comes to making the fine changes that make a good design go to being a great design there's it's hard to do in the industry because it's limited by language. And when you, the experts have to communicate to the engineers using words, what to change. If it, you know, if it needs to be faster or stiffer, all of those things are things that from an engineering standpoint, it's like you want to hit your head off the wall, trying to interpret exactly how you're going to do something that's going to reflect things that you can describe in words and so when there are people who can both cast and fish and have a vision of what the feeling is they're trying to achieve for a rod can also make the changes to you know if they have different tapers available to them or they're able to adjust the way the pattern is cut so the wall thickness is maybe different on the male end, you know, or greater on the male end or greater on the female end or less on either end as you're, you know, manipulating that, uh, that variable. That's where the, that's the fine tuning of a rod. And so in order to make something like a 10 foot, 10 inch two weight nymph rod, oftentimes in the industry there's only going to be a handful of people who can potentially do that and then a bunch of companies who are going to put that, those things on a deflection board and measure them and go and copy that interesting <laughs> so so um so i am fortunate to be one of the people who it's very easy for me to see both sides of this the the engineering side and the product side for a wide range of things for, you know, from something from a one weight up to a 16 weight blue water rod that I might use to catch mako sharks or bluefin tuna. That's all of that spectrum is comfortable for me from a, you know, from a design angle. So, uh, yeah, that's my, that's my breakdown of some of the rod design variables you can change. No, that's fantastic. And let me run something past you because so um, I have a couple different jobs and one of them is that I work full time for a fly shop and you have tons of people coming in that want to buy fly rods and things of that sort. And the way I describe it sounds a little bit like how you just described rod design, especially kind of the we'll call it a symbiotic relationship that you have both with the engineering and the feel and the actual expert casting side of it. So I describe the mechanics of a cast, but then obviously there's a budget always involved um, in buying fly rods, but um, granting there's no budget at the moment being discussed, 
I usually tell them that everybody has a, a casting character. And it's literally how I describe it, just because I haven't figured out a better way to say it. And the only way to kind of discover that is to take a couple different rods out that may cast differently, different flex and so forth, and get them into their hands. Give them a, a, a little casting lesson so that they have the mechanics down so that it's relatively fair when you put the different rods in their hands. And I, I, and I tell them, you, what, I, what I see time and time again is people will get that, um, the National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation, I found my Christmas tree look when they come across the rod that just seems to work really good for them, like their character now seems to be expressed in what was designed mathematically and engineered in a sense, especially if you talk to, um, um, well, just Mac Brown when it comes to, to, to casting mechanics and his uh, ridiculously but awesome hard book on, on casting angles and things like that to, uh, <laughs> to, to try to understand and better your casting kind of meets getting it into somebody's hands that, that has a little bit of the, the math and now isn't applying it, you know, from a personal casting point of view. And I'm asking this specifically for me so that I could be better customer service. Is, is that a, is that an okay way to describe that kind of thing to somebody that does that make sense or am I just sounding like a lunatic? Yeah, no, it's, it, it makes sense. And it's a, it's a complex process and it is, more subjective than objective it uh it's different for different people and you know the 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 line match has a lot to do with how a rod is going to feel and between having worked in the industry on both sides of those uh those things there's oftentimes a line match you can give for a certain rod or action that'll make it perform where you know where the guy's like wow this is a nice balanced match and oftentimes not the best rod but a really good match with it is going to feel better for someone than a really good rod and a non-square match with the line with an underload or overloaded uh line so i i agree with everything you say and within that i would highly stress the nuances of line as also being a variable that is an important uh if you if some if you really know the lines that are available and the head weights of them and the rod actions that match up with those those head weights it empowers someone to match up people with the right line for the rod or rod for the line less often usually someone has a rod and they're trying to get it to cast right with the uh, different lines but yeah the line has a ton to do with everything that happens in the fly industry that makes sense and i i appreciate that that pointer too because that like i said earlier uh well in a conversation offline that was that's important to me because i try to think more customer side than 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 my my position necessarily you know and try to make a company money because I want people to be happy, but I also want them to be matched the best I can possibly do that, granting circumstances and, and available equipment. So I appreciate that. So um, as far as, and I'm actually going to be talking to um, a gentleman who does a lot of rod building, a ton of rod building with um, uh, Diamond Black uh, Blanks um, in a day or two here on an interview, because I thought it'd be a cool segue to go from the the the, the techie and the, 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 the ground level and the, the nitty gritty to somebody who's taking what you design and actually custom custom making some of this stuff, which leads me to this question. I'm going to ask him the same question too, which is when it comes to rod components, is there a major difference between um, a, a guide choice and so forth? Um, I, I know that on the NIF rods that you've designed, the, the down locking reel seat and all that is very purposeful. But in some of the other ones, is it is it more just aesthetics, or is, is there function there as well that uh, shouldn't be overlooked in selecting a rod? The the guide <clears throat> the guide selection is important. the the shape the placement of the guides is very important with the casting and the performance of a rod with how it uh, lifts and how smoothly it distributes the load of what you're putting through it. But the the 
for me, the big factor that's the real under appreciated factor that's been overlooked by the industry and, and is messing up a lot of things across the industry is the snake guides in trying to make rods, snake and single foot guides, and trying to make rods that are lighter. They the industry has cut a corner with using these finer wire snake guides that are absolutely inhibit the casting performance of the fly lines that we use and if you think of the physics of when you have a fly rod that is heavily flexed as someone is casting the line and they're hauling so they're the rod is flexed and they're pulling the line through the guides while the rod is flexed at the apex of the bend of the rod whichever guide is closest to that apex of the bend of the rod that guide is going to have that plastic fly line folded over it at a very sharp angle as you are pulling on it across that edge and so think of you know having you know a sharp edge of the the corner of a table or something and seesawing your plastic fly line back and forth across it. And for the most part, nearly anything you can buy on the market right now has guides that are smaller than what fly line is comfortable getting pulled over while you're hauling. And so the, the best performance guides to put on regular fly rods, especially the larger, the, the, line weight gets the thicker the fly line gets and the easier it is to fold into the guide the right size guides for these rods look disproportionately huge to what the industry standard is right now because the industry standard has blindly made the wire diameter of the guides they're using too small interesting and and you're describing that and, and it's very very clear to me that you know what you're talking about because I'm a steam engine learner, which means it takes me a lot of books and a lot of study to grasp certain concepts. And as you're describing that to me, I'm picturing this all vividly in my mind of exactly what you're talking about. And I actually kind of see, I wouldn't say I've experienced a hindrance where I've known it, but I can actually see what you're saying about, because it, I can see it get hung up. I can see it where it, it, it'll, it'll, like you say, inhibit the cast. And the flow of the line through the guides because it's 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 a it's a bump in the road. It's like a speed bump almost in a sense, or actually probably it's a little hor- worse. It's horrible for the fly line as well. And <clears throat> there's a Johnny Cash song where he says, "If I never saw the sunshine, Lord, I would not cuss the rain." And if you've never recently cast a fly rod that had just like normal size pack bay hard chrome guides on it compared to the fine wire things in the past decade have become the absolute commonplace like every everyone has gone too small you wouldn't realize how much easier it is to false cast and and carry line out with the lines that we use with rods that have guides that are the right size it's an incredible thing that we have led each other to this point in the industry one more question about the tech side of it. That's kind of a soft question before I ask you a couple final questions here, because of the limited um, ability of unique individuals that can see both in the physical physics side of things that, but then also um, have a deep relationship with casting such as yourself. Are you able and do you have a group of people that you're able to, to, to train and to pass this, this, this gift, this skill onto? Because I can see that if it doesn't make it, of course, there'll, there'll be the remnants of, of everything people like yourself are doing. But a lot of times, coming back to the guide selection, those things get overlooked in their importance when folks like you are out of the picture. <laughs> I, I'd like to use that platform to say that uh, when I first started working at TNT, which I was hired there to be the sales manager, not the rod designer, Tom Dorsey was working there. And I didn't get much time working together doing product stuff with Tom Dorsey, but I did get a little bit. 
And Tom Dorsey was someone who could design by feel and by engineering. Hmm. And, uh, and so there were a few, and my, my strategy for doing it is different than Tom's was, but certainly being able to see someone's strategy from a wide angle view with the different rods that Tom developed at uh, TNT over years in the time before I was there, that was very helpful for me to develop a really to have some of the I, understandings of how much, you know, wall thickness you need to be strong or, you know, uh, there's just some things where if you can look at the, engineering work and you can feel the product you can feel the rod and be like okay this is what this looks like on paper for someone who thinks the way i do i can fill in a lot of blanks in my brain between what stuff should look you know what as things change on paper how the change how the feel changes and so not just being able to work with tom but i would say more so being able to see like 20 years of design work that Tom had done there at TNT and also be able to see the engineering work behind it was the, that was the most, that was a huge jumping off platform for me to design stuff in some, some different ways that, uh, that I didn't have to do as much as Tom did to get to where he was to, progress a little bit to where I was. I, you know, that's a short way of saying it. So in a, in a very real sense, there was a, a mentoring that, that took place there that, that, you know, he cut all that curve off a little bit from, from his expertise. And you got he to wasn't of... intentionally trying to men mentor me whatsoever, but I would say unintentionally. Yes. Gotcha. That did happen. Gotcha. Very, very cool. Um, so really just three more questions. And the first one is, do you have a favorite fishing story that just kind of sticks out with you, whether it's funny or just, you know, um, just means an awful lot that you wouldn't mind sharing. I've, I've got a, a big fiberglass reproduction muskie on my wall and it's actually not nearly the biggest one that I've caught on, uh, on a fly, but it was the first big one that I caught on my fly on a fly and it was alone in the 12 foot aluminum boat that I fish out of. And, uh, that was the longest fight I ever had with a muskie. <laughs> and I, it was a day where the conditions were good and I had recently caught one about 25 pounds, which at that time seemed like a really big one. And I was fishing alone in crap conditions, like windy, wavy, high, dirty water. And earlier in the day, I had hooked and lost a massive fish that I wasn't convinced it was a fish based on how heavy it was when I hooked it and didn't lean on it. And then I dropped it, and I, but, but I was able to size it up and knew it was real big. So the whole whole day after that was like 10 in the morning and the whole day i was telling myself i'm going to get another big bite today and i am just going to strip the hell out of the line to keep tight to the to anything that bites my fly today and so uh maybe i don't know three three four in the afternoon mid to not not evening but afternoon i got a bite and as I came tight to the fish, I could tell it was a heavy fish and I didn't look up whatsoever. I was so focused on stripping the, uh, having good line handling on the fish. And I was like, the rod was corked. And I was stripping the line. I was like, oh, you know, this is going great. And the, and I didn't even like look up in front of me and until the, like the surface broke in front of me and the clearly the biggest muskie I'd ever had my hands on a really like thick, very girthy and huge headed, uh, thick female, like a, 
like a 35 pound 48 inch fish big river fish came up came right up into view and then immediately half up out of the water thrashing with its head out of the water right at my feet for and it did it for what seemed like an eternity it was like six seconds eight seconds and i was like and the fish was just thrashing i had both hands holding 12 weight like square because i'd put so much pressure on the fish that I dragged it all the way to the surface <laughs> and my my big fray bill net was there locked in place right in front of me and after like about five seconds i was like i am going to try to net this i'm going to try to hold the weight of this fish boat side with one hand and pick up the huge net with my other hand which and so <clears throat> the opportunity seemed good the only problem was the fish was too big and so when i tried to hold it with one hand i picked the net up and reached over to net it and the fish sank back into the water and got its bearings about it and as i was reaching to net it it just exploded back into the depths and i was had the line pinned under my whole fist with that 12 weight rod trying to hold it and tried to tried to hold the fish and i literally extended my shoulder from the socket and lost a grip on the uh on the line and all the you know 80 feet of line that I had out that I was casting there in the boat just all peeled out onto the rod as the fish swam off into the depths until it came tight like you know there a full nearly I didn't have the whole fly line out so I wasn't in my backing but the fish you know came tight on the 12 weight like 80 feet away and uh and after that the thing fought hard it uh it made at one point, it made a straight vertical move in about 20 feet of water where I had to point the rod straight up and down because it was kind of going under the boat. And I think it might have folded the uh, the 12 weight with how much drag pressure I had turned up. <laughs> but then I, I, I eventually pumped her up out of the depths and, you know, netted, unhooked and released that uh, that fish and, and got a beautiful fiberglass reproduction from Fitante in Wisconsin, who I think is the best. I know some people try to claim lax, but uh, if you look at their work, it's hard to hard to argue against Joe Fatante's fiberglass reproduction muskies. And so that was money well spent for that uh, artwork. That is a fantastic story. And the, the I also I I've never really fished with a GoPro. Okay, but uh, I had a GoPro there in the boat, and so when that fish ran all the way out into the depths, I knew I couldn't even see the fly when the fish was bow. So I knew that the the fly was just buried in the mouth of that fish. I picked up the GoPro and turned it on and filmed the last three minutes of the fight netting and then releasing that, uh, that fish. So that I am positive that that's not a, a fleeting memory because <laughs> I have a, a, a video of, of me, uh, of me doing it. And, uh, and, and by far the, the the best fight I've had with a muskie. I've caught, I don't know, six muskies bigger than that now on flies, but nothing that was as intense as that uh, experience. And being the first one of that, uh, you know, after that, the big ones were, you know, an inch or two bigger. You know, they weren't like a whole different class of fish. That was the first, like, 35-pound fish. That was just a whole different animal fish to get my hands on. Well, that, that just leads me to say for uh, folks like me, and I'm sure people can uh, are going to agree with this, hurry up on those musky rods. <laughs> um, so last one question kind of has two different points. What is the best piece of advice that you've ever been given for life? And same goes for, for fly fishing. <clears throat> I'm not clear on my best life advice. Maybe that's the reason that I'm like a designing fishing equipment for a living. But uh, I will say that on the fishing advice, there's a couple conversations that stand out to me, but they all were along the same lines. When one, when I was very young from someone who was a, a gifted fly angler and then another with uh, Dave Whitlock, 
when I was probably still working at Cortland Line in my mid twenties, where the one with Dave Whitlock, I it, I had already one of one of the other you know aside from the musky things, I have I believe the best selling crayfish fly pattern in the industry right now, and uh, Dave Whitlock you know had was someone who as i was even before musky fishing doing things like developing that uh that crayfish pattern and some of the freestone really big uh trout work that i was uh doing for years when i was working there at uh courtland line <clears throat> talking to dave whitlock about those imitative patterns and dave whitlock said that when he was young he was in these had these free these like mountain limestone streams that the, were very clear and the trout were very smart and the fly patterns that uh, he wanted to fly fish and he could cast and, and knew how to rig up the fly equipment at a young age but the flies that he could go and get his hands on were these generic attractor type patterns where they were things like a mother minnow or a mickey fin or a gold ribs hair's ear uh, flies, uh, these classic type patterns that really weren't very imitative. And he said, I could put on a live cricket and I could catch these wild trout would grab that, uh, you know, small black cricket in an instant. And I couldn't get them to eat these things that I could buy at the shop. And so I had to create a cricket, <laughs> you know, he described some of the, fly patterns that he created out of necessity to as a as a kind of a younger kid to uh to catch some of those fish that he could catch with the live bait and dave's perspective of looking at things from the perspective of the fish looking at every aspect of the food source looking at things underwater all things that uh for me are uh, have on the fishing side of things are my my textbook for how i go about uh doing things whether it be musky you know making a musky fly or figuring figuring out a strategy to fish for a musky or a big wild trout or a uh, false albacore from shore in the ocean which i also love to do all of that is things where at times having a really precise detailed approach makes a difference in the success and although i don't do things the way dave whitlock did i think dave whitlock's approach is my favorite reference in the in the fly fishing industry to just doing things the right way i love that and i appreciate you sharing that with us let's round that out can you give if if you're on um social media and all that kind of stuff and if it's helpful um, what are a couple of ways that people can find you, follow you, whatever, if you don't mind giving those out? Uh, the most common place where I share things on Instagram, where I'm uh, teeth and trout, there's an underscore between them. But I think if you search for teeth and trout, you would find that. And uh, Diamondback Fly Rods is the Diamondback uh, website there or Instagram, so social media. Also, the main place that I share things Uh I share some of the design stuff I'm working on at Diamondback through that social media site. So those are the two places where I'm sharing things most commonly. And on Instagram, I, I try to, as you're, you know, do, kind of hitting this mostly on the, uh, on the predator fishing side of things, I share photos of my flies and some of my strategies, not all the time, but there are some, pretty distinct things that I try to share with people that uh, if I put them someplace, it's, it'll be on Instagram. Well, that's awesome. And please find them, check it out. There you have it, ladies and gentlemen, from Journey on the Fly, the podcast. That was Joe Goodspeed from Diamondback Fly Rods. And man, what a really cool conversation. And Joe, when you hear this again, I know I am redundant in saying thank you and I appreciate your time, but I really mean it. And I just want to get that across. Um, it's clear that his education in English literature is popping through because he's articulate and it's clear that his dad did an amazing job of conveying the world of 
uh, fly fishing, outdoors, and connecting that all together in engineering. And um, just a really cool story of how you just don't know sometimes how all this stuff ends up working together. You know, there's things that sometimes people think that folks were wasting their time with, and they could be doing this or they could be doing that. And I don't think that's the case ever when it comes to fly fishing, just for its therapeutic uh, 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 value that it brings alone. But here you have a situation where all that accumulated into what he's doing today for the world of fly fishing. And in my opinion, from my standpoint, and I hope that uh, the listeners out there would agree with me, that I would off- offer up a round of applause and say thank you for the work you're doing because I think it's challenging the industry and I think it's producing equipment that is worthy to be in the hands of the world's fly fishers. So thank you for your time and I'm out of here because I'm going to go hang out with the family. It's the Christmas season and we have this uh, way of getting into the Christmas spirit and for the first 20 plus days of the month we watch goofy Christmas movies from all sorts of things and it's just a cool way that we do as a family to get us into the spirit so go be with your families thanks for listening and we'll be back soon god bless